Today on this episode of Going Deeper, we tackle some difficult concepts of sin and stoning and battle in the Old Testament book of Joshua chapters 7 and 8. I am your host, Kyle McCaskill. I am Marie Burns. Becky Clark. And we are going to get into this right after the intro. For those of us who have read this but don't remember, because it might have been a couple of weeks, what happens in seven and eight? <laughs> okay, uh, so the, you're, so this week we are doing chapter seven and eight. So last week we talked about uh, the people taking Jericho. Mm-hmm. We are now in the promised land, taking mm-hmm. the land. And if, right. one of the things that we need to clarify, make sure, is understood completely. The people are only taking the land that God has given them. God owns all of this land. He owns all of creation. It is his to give or take away. Right. And that's important because we're going to have so many kind of things that will happen in some ways. Like God kind of takes away AI and right. then he gives it again because of the people's disobedience. So what happens in chapter 7 and chapter 8 is in a very short synopsis, and we can go through it a little more after that, but in a very short synopsis, they the people of God were successful in Jericho. We talked about the harem. They have fully devoted, and they're mm-hmm. moving on in their campaign. Mm-hmm. And um, the author of our story is very interesting because he gives us a piece of information on the very front end that the people don't know, mm-hmm. and that's that... There was a guy in the Israelite camp who was disobedient, and he takes some of the things that he was not supposed to take. So that sets us up to know there's going to be a problem, but the people don't know that yet. Mm -hmm. So they go in, they send spies, the spies say, AI is real small, we don't need to send everybody in. So let's just send a small contingency of Israelites to take Mm -hmm. AI. I already see a stark contrast the very first time. We sent in spies Mm -hmm. a generation back, and they're like, there's no way. Now it's like, (laughs) we got this. Right, right. (laughs) Just send in a few. We're good. (laughs) Right. So uh, So Joshua says, okay. So they send in a small contingency. The small contingency basically is driven out of AI, and they lose some lives of Israelites. Mm -hmm. And so... Joshua is very confused and very upset. So he he and the elders throw themselves in front of God and are like, what happened here? What I mean, you told us we could have the land and all this mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And Can't that's when... One guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, we talked about earlier. Yahweh says... Um, there's been someone has taken the devoted things, but he doesn't tell Joshua who it is. Mm-hmm. Instead, he says, bring everybody together and we're going to cast lots to determine who it is. Mm. And so the thing about lots <clears throat> is uh, lots were created uh, in Leviticus. There's the Um and Thurman. Uh, and that is basically that the priests would throw uh, these rocks and to have to make godly decisions. And mm-hmm. the idea was that God had determined how they would land and all that kind of stuff. And we'll see lots later on when we divide so, the land. Yeah. So they cast lots and they break down from big Israelites to tribes to families to whatever. And they come up with this one guy who has done Messed wrong. Messed it up for everybody. Yeah. Messed it up for everybody. And... Um, <laughs> In the end, basically, his disobedience has messed it up, and he will be punished. And he was punished by the whole community stones him and his family and all of his things. And they burn it to the ground, and then they place a memorial where all of it was. Wow. Um, And so then in chapter 8, so it says at the end of chapter 7, the Lord's anger is turned away now. It's gone. Um, It no longer burns for the Israelites. And in chapter 8, they have a successful campaign to AI. They take AI. And at the end of chapter 8, there's a really interesting ceremony that happens uh, of a kind of recommitment, a re-reading of the covenant law, which seems a little out of place, but not necessarily. So that's the short synopsis of... 
Well, already I'm proud of our Israelites, that they were so confident and trusting in God after what happened in Jericho, that they looked at the land and said, we can, we can do this. They had all this confidence, which they were, they've been lacking in the past and will lack in the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, but right here in this moment, they are, they, the, the majority of them were moving in the way that God had called them to. They were trusting mm-hmm. God. They were going forward. We can do this. That one guy, mm-hmm. man, that's rough. And you talk about how they had to handle him, and that's rough. Well, I think it's a powerful illustration of our sin does not exist in isolation. Yes. And, and even something as small as the guy taking some of the chareim, because yeah. that's the that's the word for this that's been mm-hmm. dedicated the accursed things. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that that similar word mm-hmm. um, here. That that seems like a pretty small thing, and but even that, I, I think it's less to do with the act and more to do with the heart of it. Mm. Um, I mean, <clears throat> because it comes down to obedience. It does. And yes. I think that's that's a very important thing. It doesn't necessarily matter so much that he took the stuff. Mm-hmm. It's that he he did something that God said don't do. They were because God a gets to times. yeah, God gets to call the shots. Mm-hmm. But we don't get to call the shots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what he takes doesn't seem to be actually hugely significant. He takes mm-hmm. a cloak. Right. Um, he takes some silver that um, I think is in the end, like it was like six pounds or something yeah. is when you kind of work it out. And then he takes like a block of gold. Now, the gold and the silver were supposed to be dedicated and devoted to the Lord's treasury. Then so, that's why I kind of went, eh, because... At that point, it is essentially God's. This guy stole from right. God. Yeah. That is rather significant, I think. I mean, we we talk about when we were doing Leviticus. This goes back to Leviticus. And when they would be doing all of their sacrifices and cleansing and using the blood on, like, the horns. Do you remember all of that? And part of that had to do with the with the elements themselves, the mm-hmm. pieces that were used in the purification of the items within the temple, because sin is uh, like sticky, nasty, gets all over everything, yeah. and so we have to even cleanse the items within God's temple mm-hmm. and purify them. So if it's been devoted to God, it is a sin, it is a devoted thing, right? He has done a pretty significant thing, and so I'm kind of fascinated, too, that the covenant renewal shows up after this. It's kind of like, okay, now you remember, Yeah. so let's make it official. Now you remember, I am a holy God, and I made this holy treaty with my people that called you to be holy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, I think that's why the... The, this thing at the end of chapter 8 is placed where it is. Now, I, I don't know definitively. Mm-hmm. That's the debate back and forth is this last part where they go to Gilgal and Ebal. They were told to, to go there. And like Deuteronomy 27 talks about um, at some point when you're in the land, you have to go to Gilgal and, and uh, Mount Ebal, which are, are two mountains that have a valley in the middle. They face each other. Okay. Yeah. And God has has laid out what they need to do. They need to build um, an altar there with um, by hand, and then they need to read all of the law. They split the 12 tribes, six and six, mm-hmm. and they read the blessings and the curses of the law. So the, mm-hmm. they were told to do that before they entered the land to take to at some point. Mm-hmm. And obviously we know they do it. Did it happen right after AI? I don't know, but I think our author is being intentional, just as we talked about the fact that our author is a theologian who is trying to Mm -hmm. not just tell you the story of taking the promised land, but is also trying to convey to us, to the listener, of who God is Mm -hmm. and how he um, fulfills his promises, but also that God is a jealous God, that God Mm -hmm. is a God who um, has tons of grace and mercy, Mm -hmm. but also, as we talked about again, has judgment and he has wrath and um, 
you know, he's he's trying to make that clear to the people. Mm-hmm. So that this ceremony falls after the failure mm-hmm. and then the success of a of AI kind of it reinforces that point of who God is and how important obedience is to the law, not because obedience to the law was supposed to be miserable, but mm-hmm. because obedience to the law actually um, allowed the people to have all of these blessings mm-hmm. that God wanted mm-hmm. for them. And we make the law, when we talk about the law, a lot of times the law just seems so, and we talked about this in Leviticus, it just seems so heavy and it seems like all these restrictions mm-hmm. and we don't want to do it. We hate no and all that, but it's yeah. not, that's not the intent. Right. And so they have this thing at, at Ebel where they, they are reminded of the blessings and then the curses of disobedience mm-hmm. because they had this one who was disobedient. And because he was disobedient, they all lost. They lost 36 lives, which is not significant. Yeah. But it's significant when you think about they didn't lose any lives at Jericho. Right. right. Not a one. Yeah. And they shouldn't have lost any lives at AI. Right. Mm-hmm. But they did. Mm. Mm. Uh, one of the other things that, you know, the more I was, we talked about this yesterday with Pastor Doug um, and the, the beauty of the fact that he knows Hebrew much, much better than I could probably ever imagine to know. Uh, he made a point that in this first verse of chapter seven, where it's telling the author is kind of giving us the inside information, he says that... Um, you know, the people of Israel broke faith. This one guy took some of the devoted things. And he conveyed to me, Pastor Doug, that that word took from its Hebrew really means to marry. Okay, wait, say that again. So this word took, and he didn't give me the Hebrew word for it, so I'll have to go back and ask him. But basically in Hebrew, we, we, have, we have not... Um, we have not given its correct information, basically, when it has been translated. It means, more specifically from the Hebrew, to marry. So, the idea is that Achan married himself to the devoted things. Ah. And that's important because when we get to Achan's punishment, his consequences it becomes more clear why those consequences were what they were. Because mm-hmm. I was really struggling with that. Yeah. I was struggling with, I mean, I, I get he should be stoned. Mm-hmm. He, he took the devoted things. Right. It has caused the people, ultimately, as we talk about the fact that your sin does not just affect you. Right. It affects everyone. And I use the example of, like, even if I am... I choose to lie about my lie to myself about something. Uh-huh. Ultimately, it's going to seep out right. to how I talk to you guys mm-hmm. about things. I'm going to convince you of my lie. Yeah. Well, now I've lied to you, and so now it affects you. I mean, it's the things that we think don't, they do. Mm-hmm. So ultimately, his sin has affected the other people. So I get why he needs to be sp- stoned. But I struggle with his family and all of his sure. possessions and livestock yeah. and things like that. But mm-hmm. when I think about this idea of marrying, Achan has committed adultery mm-hmm. against Yahweh. Right. And throughout Leviticus, it talks about adultery, sexual sins, blasphemy of the spirit. That mm-hmm. is a stonable offense, and it has mm-hmm. to be a stonable offense that all the people of God have to participate in. Mm-hmm. And you you have to blot out that right. strong sin. That I mean, not that there's levels, but like God is saying, you have married yourself and committed adultery and blasphemy too against mm-hmm. me. So yeah. that is why it's such a strong and harsh sentence for he and his family um and it's still mm-hmm. hard it's that's a i'm yeah. st- i still struggle with like <laughs> yeah. yeah but still like his whole family jo- joan is joan's wife didn't know you know right. like she mm-hmm. she didn't he hid them yeah. he, he buried the stuff 
Yeah. But it also sends a huge message to the people of God. I mean, this is a, you will remember again, because they build an altar here. Yeah. There you go. You can look out on Jericho and see where God has led and been faithful and Mm -hmm. taken the land. And that's always a place of remembrance. And now you can see this pile of rocks where Achan and his family and all of his things were burned to remember what happens with disobedience? Mm-hmm. What happens when when the anger of God burns against you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because you chose to marry yourself to things that are not of him. Mm-hmm. And that's a hard lesson to learn. But as we're taking the land and we're purging it mm-hmm. of everything that is not of God, mm-hmm. you don't want to let anything enter in. Right. You know? It's still hard. I still a struggle to. Sure. Mm-hmm. That's. It's a lot of. It reminds me a lot of what we went through with when we were unpacking Leviticus, which someday I want another stab at that. Me too. But um, as we were talking about the stonable offenses and how how awful that must have been, and everybody in the community has participated. What a message it is, and what you know that. Your sin does affect everybody, as you mm-hmm. were saying, but that I'm just so thankful for Jesus. I don't right. know how else to put it. It's, yeah. it. It brought us back over and over and over again to how grateful we are for Christ mm-hmm. and how, I mean, God was trying to teach them so many things. They had been living in polytheism for 400 years. Yeah. He was trying so hard to move them to a new place where we said time and again that when you send at this point and we we went through the ritualistic things there was little expectation for a heart change mm-hmm. at that point he's just trying to get them to the point where you recognize and i say he just just is not the right word god's thinking is so much higher than mine what i can understand of this is he's trying to bring them to a new place of understanding of what's right and wrong. Mm -hmm. You see what the Canaanites are doing? Don't do that. Mm -hmm. Do you see how your sin affects other people? Don't do that. Mm -hmm. They have to be involved in wiping away your sins by stoning. I mean, don't don't put that burden on the people around you by sinning. He's Mm -hmm. trying to bring them to this new place. And probably so much more is going on there that I'll never know or understand. Mm -hmm. But how thankful I am for Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I we, we've laughed and made jokes about Jesus in the New Testament and that love and grace was still there in the Old Testament yeah. because God never changes. And we can go all the way through the Old Testament and pull out story after story of God's grace and God's love. Look at Ruth. Look at Hosea and Gomer. Look at the fact that he brought the people out of the land first. He heard them. He rescued them. Mm-hmm. Manna. Water from a rock. Like over and over and over again, clothed Adam and Eve. But sin is still a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He still cannot abide where there is sin. But man, it still makes this hard to read. Even after what we went through with Jericho, going yeah. ahead and reading on about the about the taking of the southern realm and then the northern, mm-hmm. it's like, woof, that's hard to read. <laughs> yeah. Joshua was Wow, what he did to those kings, standing on their necks before he killed them, and woo, it is, it doesn't make it any easier to read. I want people to know, it doesn't make it any easier to read. It's just, you can kind of take a step back over and over again and go, okay, God's ways are higher than mine. Plus, our culture was different, too, the way we think about how we fight, battle Mm -hmm. nowadays. Mm -hmm. It's not... The way that it happened then, and we cannot say that it was better or worse. Right. It just was that. Yeah. And we can't judge the past culture. Mm-hmm. We just learn from it. Right. And we need to know it to learn from it. Yeah. Right. So. Hmm. I was going to say I think it's uh, an important aspect in here when Joshua is going before the Lord. He's very clear and says in so many words that 
I'm not really worried about this because what's going to happen to me, I'm worried about what's going to happen to you, God. Mm. I want your name to to remain at the forefront of things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very powerful, it's a very consistent message from Joshua, that he is consistently thinking about God first Mm -hmm. and wanting to be that proper messenger or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, representative, mm-hmm. I guess, mm-hmm. of of God to not just the Israelites, but to let all the people of the land know this is God, this is Yahweh. Everything we're doing here is, is for Yahweh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but what's interesting is that I still feel like uh, Joshua missed the mark in his his pleas to to Yahweh mm-hmm. that we know as the reader mm-hmm. what has transpired. Right. It doesn't seem to cross Joshua's mind as he's laying prostrate with the elders and kind of rending his clothes and all that kind of stuff in front of Yahweh that the reason that this has all transpired is because the people were disobedient. Yeah. And I, I do appreciate what you're saying, and I agree – he is he is worried about the, the Canaanites had fear of you. Mm-hmm. They they knew of your power and might. If we have lost at AI and our hearts are now melted, because Scripture says that, mm-hmm. then how are the Canaanites going to perceive you now? Mm-hmm. You will no longer be seen as feared and the most powerful and all that kind of stuff. And your name, your great name, mm-hmm. may no longer be great yeah Mm -hmm. and maybe there's there's definitely an aspect of selfishness there because maybe it's uh the the fear that the canaanites have of yahweh yeah that is protecting joshua and what's going to happen to your name in in effect so now what's going to happen to me (laughs) right (laughs) i mean it's true and he his his plea joshua's plea is very reminiscent of um moses's plea in the desert and i don't ask me what passage but it sounds Mm -hmm. very familiar of what you know kind of when moses is like he should have just left us in israel uh, in in egypt and you know why'd you bring us out here (laughs) all this kind of stuff you should have just left us in in the wandering desert Mm -hmm. because it seems here there is now loss which i think it's just joshua's frustration of not understanding Mm -hmm. what has happened because they just came off this really amazing campaign of taking Jericho where they didn't lose any lives and they didn't, I mean, it was powerful. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. you're set at this point to continue to do God to do amazing things. And then they lose life and all the Israelites are afraid. Yeah. And it's like, what happened here? Mm -hmm. And so God corrects them and says, it's not because of, Anything. I mean, it's because you were disobedient. Yeah. There was disobedience, and my anger reigns because of that disobedience. Mm-hmm. I mean, we just... Did you not see Jericho? <laughs> you know, did you not see what happened? And Aiken just went in, and I get it. I mean, they he... Were, and they were warned. I, I want to say there were two warnings in Chapter 6, or it might have been 5 and 6 together. Don't take the things devoted to God. <laughs> don't, mm-hmm. don't touch it. Yep. Don't be tempted by it. And... Achan was tempted by it, he took it, and he hid it in his tent yeah. under the dirt. He knew it's wrong. You don't hide what you... You don't that's right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You always hide what you're not supposed to have. Right. That's right. My son goes to bed at night, turns all the lights off, and has a flashlight to read in bed because he knows he's not supposed to. Mm-hmm. So he sits under the covers and hides. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. we hide what we know we're not supposed to have or do or whatever. Yeah. That's when we know we shouldn't be doing or having or whatever, uh-huh. you know? True. So. As I'm looking at chapter 7 and just kind of refreshing my memory, it says in verse 15, He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. And I think about how we talk about the sin affects the whole community. That's why they're involved in the stoning. Yeah. It would make sense then that his breaking of the covenant then affects the whole community. Mm-hmm. And more so, more and more, the more I think about it, the more it makes sense to me why they, whether it really happened or our author just 
put that there, the fact that a covenant renewal happened mm-hmm. when it did, mm-hmm. it makes sense to me. Yeah. They he he broke covenant for everybody when he messed with the devoted things. <clears throat> Here's the other thing that I was thinking about in regards to the covenant renewal that happens at Ebal. And even this story. Because when we talked about Rahab back in chapter 2, mm-hmm. Rahab is this Canaanite woman who has been given the opportunity to be assimilated into the people of God. Yeah. By this point, she is... Not maybe not fully assimilated because you're right. She had to sit outside the land, as you know, all that kind of the people uh-huh. and stuff. But she's probably seen this with Aiken now, and she's at the covenant renewal because mm-hmm. everybody had to be at the covenant right. renewal. All the sojourners and the whatever else, right. as well as the people of God, are all there to hear. So the contrast between this Canaanite woman who has declared the power and authority of God. As a Canaanite woman mm-hmm. is now getting to see what happens when you are disobedient, and now she is ushered into the covenant as a yeah. sojourner, which which to me, but then you've also got Achan, who is an Israelite, right. who just watched the Jordan River part, who just watched Jericho be taken, uh-huh. who is part of the covenant of the yeah. people of God and is disobedient and he is stoned and then obviously he's not there for the covenant renewal. Right. The contrast between these two people is very interesting and again mm-hmm. the fact that the covenant renewal mm-hmm. happens when it does. Yeah. Is uh, bravo to our author. <laughs> <laughs> and what he's trying to to convey to mm-hmm. us as a as a reader and a a studier and trying to understand mm-hmm. who God is more clearly. Indeed. Well, so I'll ask this question. It's something that we've batted around. By the way, a quick side note, just because I can't help myself. The covenant renewal, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. That, Mount Gerizim. I've been saying it wrong. Go okay. y'all. Mount Gerizim. It's an umphalus. Yes, you and I talked about that. That's it not is. my side. That, that's just an aside. It's a quick rabbit hole. Sorry. Yeah. It's an umphalus. Okay. <laughs> anyway. I guess intentionally because of what happens there too. Yep. So my question is, I have, and I have no answers. Okay. Jericho was obviously a very unique battle. Mm-hmm. So here's a question that you, I think you posed to me. Yeah. But now I'm going to bat it back out there <laughs> to you and to Kyle. The rest of the battles, is that Joshua being the great military leader that he is? Or does God give the orders? Because there's some interesting military stuff that happens, uh, the way they handle AI and some other places with flanking and things like that and kind of deception. Does God give those orders? Or is Joshua just that good and God said, go take the land to however you need to get there, just get there. Go forth and m- go militarize. Forth. <laughs> right. Be That's a good my question. military leader. So, because that kind of plays into our holy war discussion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jericho is the only battle we know of where God specifically gave the orders of how it needed to happen. And he was there in the ark with the priests. To my to my knowledge, we don't see the priests again in a battle. But I'm, I may not be remembering correctly. Although I did just finished reading all the battles yesterday. I don't remember seeing the priests anywhere. Mm. They're not an AI's battle. Yeah, it's and I just military. finished reading back through the rest of the taking through chapter 12. And I don't remember seeing the priests or the ark anywhere else. So there's my question. Oh. Did God, did God just <laughs> sanction it and say, go forth, Joshua? Or did God say, when you get to AI this time around, do it this way. When you get to the southern kingdom... Yeah, that's a yeah. I asked you that question. I think Just maybe yesterday. Yeah, I know because some of the commentaries I read clearly say that uh, the Lord has given Joshua all the direction of what mm-hmm. he's supposed to do for AI. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily read that when I'm reading chapter eight. I I read at the very front end that jo- that the Lord is t- telling Joshua, okay, now it's time. Here's what you need to go do. Go take the men. You're going to take AI the way you took Jericho, which basically means you're going to kill the king. You're going to kill the people. You're going to burn the land. Mm -hmm. 
But he, the difference in this one is he tells them, um, you're going to take the spoils and the livestock for yourself, for your plunder this time. So there's a difference okay. here. Yeah. Um, but everything else you're going to, and he says, you're going to ambush the city. So he says, go ambush the city. Mm-hmm. Then we switch from the Lord's voice in chapter eight to Joshua telling the men the plan. Mm-hmm. Some commentaries say it's because God has told him what to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I mean, it's a good plan. And what we do know from the, the history of Joshua to this point is one of the reasons that he was chosen is he seems to have a very military mind. He has a mind that's thinking about strategy. And mm-hmm. um, so some of this seems to really be Joshua. Mm-hmm. Now, we're told in Chapter 8, Yahweh says, you're going to lay an ambush. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. But beyond that, I don't, I don't know. So it's kind of a good question. I mean, we could assume then that we could assume that the Lord has told Joshua how to do it, and then Joshua ha- is conveying right. mm-hmm. to the people. Could be. So can I offer my external processing version of what I think <clears throat> might be in between the lines here and? And I see it play out in uh, our modern Christian ways of things. And, you know, we're always so focused on wanting to make sure we're in God's will. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure I'm in God's will. Right. I'm doing the thing that's in God's will. I'm not yeah. going to, I'm going to pray about where I go to dinner because I want to make sure everything I do is God's <laughs> will. Right. And that is fine and good. But I think what is happening here, this larger story, is God says, just be obedient to me, mm-hmm. and I'm going to trust you with the small things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, it's, it doesn't matter where I go to eat. Mm-hmm. Joshua's smart, mm-hmm. obviously. He, you know, we, yeah. we see that. So, he knows how to win a battle. God says, go fight this battle. Joshua says... I think I know what to do. So, mm-hmm. I, I don't know that it has to be God directing every aspect of the battle because that minimizes the fact that God can use us to do great things that are greater than mm-hmm. what we could do on our own. Uh-huh. So, th- does that make any sense? Absolutely. Th- that it doesn't have to be sure. word for word, do this, do this, do this, do this. I yeah. agree. God doesn't Which, want robots. Yeah. I would also, I would venture to say that um, Joshua is a good strategist, and based upon the fact that they lost initially in AI, his plan is a little bit, pardon the pun, overkill. <laughs> 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 because of the amount of people that he takes. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the plan is a really good plan uh, yeah. to to kind of move in early, hide under in kind of a ravine area where they can't be seen. Then you've got some people that will come and hide around the back. Then when it's time, they're going to take a contingent of people and they're going to attack the city. But then they're going to run and lead the AI military to where the people are hidden. Mm-hmm. While they're fighting, the other people are going to come in and take care of the rest. It's a good plan. Yeah. I'm not sure you need 30,000 people for it, um, which is what scripture tells us that he, but there's a discrepancy of the number two, but so they start at 3,000 people when they initially go to AI and now they have 30,000 people. Um, And it's considered that AI likely, uh, there's so many things about AI, we don't even have time to get into that, but uh, it's considered that likely AI maybe only had about 5,000 altogether of of everything um so thirty thousand seems a little bit much yeah. to <laughs> that's no, like three yeah. to one or something right, kind right. of thing it's like a bit much um, I agree. Picking this so, year. but i think but i think it's because joshua wants to be <laughs> very assured in some ways that they have no problems this time um 
and and so his strategy is to be even more uh, careful, yeah. and and um, yeah, I don't know where this cover is. all the the bases that he possibly can yeah. for success. Even though success was largely, it was about. I mean, God decided anyway, as we see from AI. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, the plan worked because God was a part of that battle right. that time. My MacArthur Bible says twelve thousand population of AI, but. There's, there's such there's discrepancy. Yeah. There's yeah. It could in have here. been five thousand, twelve thousand, three thousand. It's I mean, it's it there, was it's less because, than thirty thousand. Right. There's such a discrepancy about AI. AI is a really difficult place to kind of talk about. We we haven't even covered that fact of where is AI? What was AI? Was AI Bethel? Was AI a different place? Mm-hmm. Archaeologically, AI is not shown to have actually been a city at the time that the, the understood time that the Israelites took it. So there's that. That was a, like a rabbit hole. I jumped down. And yeah. Was another one of the dangers of trying to look at the Bible exclusively as a history book. When your writers are not history professors, right? Your writers are theologians. Yeah. We have to be careful to not. Yeah. But it gets hard sometimes. Well, and it, it is. It's hard because I believe that this Bible is a, a story of real people and Absolutely. real places. And we've been to the real places. Right. And we've yeah. seen real digs of uh-huh. things. And uh-huh. so, the not that the, the truth of history be proven for me to believe... But it is nice. Yeah. Oh, it's, of course. It is fun. <laughs> of course. You know? it's, I would. I don't doubt any of this. This right. happened. It's when you go to it exclusively as a history book, trying to nail mm-hmm. down dates and times and stuff that you're yeah. you're missing out on the purpose of it. Yeah. It happened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, nobody will convince me otherwise. Yeah. Of that one. So, uh, you know, I. I guess I tend to think I put in my notes like Joshua is a really good strategist. Mm-hmm. God says ambush them, and Joshua says, "I got it. I got yeah, it. Yeah. I got an idea of how we can do this, mm-hmm. and it will be successful." And I think we see more of that mm-hmm. in the book of Joshua. We see more of him, yeah. and those that that strategy. Those are all gifts from God. That's how God created him. You yeah. know, for this time, and to go back to Esther, you know, kind of as mm-hmm. such a time as this, right. yeah. you're created and put in this place. We should believe that about ourselves and such. Such a time as this. There you go. <laughs> nice. Look at that. Nice. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think they're directed by God. Yes, I think we. Does it say it definitively within Scripture? It doesn't really matter. Doesn't really it's just matter. a question I enjoyed yeah. when you asked the other day. Sure. So just... Well, I was struggling with lots of things <laughs> at that point that I asked you the yeah. question. Mm-hmm. Which is what happens, I think, when you really spend time. It's good things that happen when you really right. spend time in the Word of God and you start asking all these questions. And then you have to weed out, like, now that's a good question, but... It doesn't determine my faith, you know, so if right. I can't figure it out. Or that's a good question just to dive into because it's, it's just, just fun. fun. Yeah. Or I just need to stop asking that question. <laughs> and it's also <laughs> a good reason why when you're digging into scripture, you need to have people around you that you can mm-hmm. bat things around with. People that you know and trust are into their Bible. And it's like when we talk about, sometimes the commentaries just get in the way. We talk about, we've been talking about with Doug uh, something about how do you read the Bible when you don't have commentaries and things like that yeah. sometimes the commentaries just get in the way Yeah. every once in a while you'll come across one that you're like mm, this is not helpful Yeah. this raises questions that don't matter or aren't important don't talk to me about earthquakes and stuff like that when it comes to the power and might of God you know if there was a big bang it's because God said bang I mean, it's just like, you know, it's, you don't have to explain everything away. We don't have to have all the answers. It's, but when you're studying scripture, it's important to have people who are, can come alongside you, people who are ahead of you, and make sure you're talking to people who are maybe just a little bit behind you. Have mentors, be a mentor, and let's all move forward together. And man, I could just, jump off into Hebrews right now but we don't have time for that mm-hmm. <laughs> encourage one another along along 
Okay, so I have a question for you okay. uh, as I'm trying to finish up my stuff for my notes for chapter eight uh, so that I can teach it on Thursday. Mm -hmm. But you are, are reading ahead mm -hmm. for the, some of the other battles. So I've read the book of Joshua, but because I'm, you know, anyway, you're just ahead for right now. In the Battle of AI, the second Battle of AI, and apparently this doesn't happen in the first battle, mm -hmm. uh, in the second battle, Scripture tells us that Joshua holds up a javelin the way that Moses holds up a staff mm -hmm. um, to kind of say, like, go, 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 and when it when it oh, lowers, yeah, yeah. stop, okay. stop, stop, kind of thing. <laughs> red light, green light. Right, red light, green light. And so it doesn't happen at Jericho, which I think we can all agree, Jericho was just such a different and unusual yes. And, and unique for what it needed to be mm -hmm. uh -huh. as the first place that we take the land and the, the ark and the priests and the, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's a reason why that one got the song written about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Not all the AI. rest are very lesser. We don't talk about the rest of the battles very right. much. We talk about Jericho because the walls came tumbling down, down, down. Uh, <laughs> so he raises this javelin uh -huh. and it's supposed to be the sign when it's lowered, we're done with mm -hmm. AI. We've we finished the battle. God tells him to raise this javelin, which is it a javelin? Is it a um, what's that called that has the curve, the stick that has the curve for when you um, oh, like a scythe? A yeah, sickle. a sickle. Mm -hmm. um, so is it a javelin? Is it a sickle? It's just kind of some debate. It's holding something up. Does he do it in any of the other battles? Mm -mm. No, I didn't see it anywhere else. I wonder if it's just an understood. <clears throat> in fact, in a lot of our other battles, it's the other kings that initiate battle. It's not mm -hmm. us going in and taking. It's them coming mm -hmm. after our Israelites, banding together, several kings of the southern kingdom, band together and come out after. And so these battles are actually happening in fields mm -hmm. more often than they're happening in cities. Now, our Israelites still chase them down into those cities and harim but not fully because we don't get fire again until mm -hmm. after AI until Hatsor and it's just like a footnote and we know that foreigners and sojourners show up but yeah. and by the way I started making a list of all the cities they conquer and then I flipped to judges mm -hmm. where they're really supposed to be taking their land and some of those cities pop back up again so we know <laughs> They don't fully harim much of anything. Mm -hmm. Whether God wanted them to or not is a different different question. But anyway, um, I don't see the to answer your question just bluntly. No, I don't. I don't recall seeing it. Well, I guess I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I'm I'm intrigued by why it's used here. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the commentaries I read said it's not like everybody, all the Israelites could have seen Joshua holding the javelin right. based upon where he was, where they were, where AI is, all that kind of stuff. And the fact that they're scattered out uh, to be able to fight the military of AI, the people of AI, it, it, it wasn't, it couldn't have necessarily been used, or I guess it could have as a symbol, but why doesn't he use it again mm -hmm. anywhere else? And I don't know. But and Maybe it is just because in a lot of the other battles that come after, it is the Canaanites that instigate battle. Mm -hmm. Not, and that's not to say that the Israelites weren't going to go take that territory, but yeah. a lot of those battles were not initiated by Joshua and the Israelites. A lot of mm -hmm. those battles were initiated by the Canaanites. And so the military plan is defend and fight back. Yeah. Um, and so maybe that's it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I don't recall... I don't recall seeing it again. Maybe so, I missed it. Then my other question would be, as we've already kind of previously talked about, in AI, God says that they can take the spoils and they can take the livestock mm -hmm. for themselves this time. Mm -hmm. and, and at Jericho, the spoils, technically, the silver, gold, iron, bronze, right. was to be put in the Lord's treasury this time, and then all the livestock burned. And we, I think, we've, I think we understand fully why that is. This time, they can take the spoils and the, the livestock for themselves. In the rest of the battles, do they have that permission as well? One of the I things think, I think they do. While you're kind of thinking about it, is one of the things that uh, a few people really have said that it. I've kind of read to flush that out was, you know, the manna stopped when they took Jericho. Mm -hmm. So the idea here at AI is that God knows the people are going to need provision as they continue their campaign through the promised land. They're going to need um, the spoils to kind of be able to trade with people if they need to. They're going to need the livestock 
for food and all that kind of stuff. So it's God's provision, continued provision, <clears throat> like he did the manna yeah. in, um, in the wilderness. And so I'm just curious if he continues that provision as they take the land, they're going to need more provision. Or maybe this was enough provision. It or, doesn't really, you know. Yeah, it doesn't really address it. It's more about the cities they took. So after these it two battles, what happens in Joshua is that we just kind of get less and less information about the rest of the battles. And the Jericho, obviously significant. AI is significant because it comes on the heels of Jericho and we have one who is disobedient. Mm -hmm. After that, our author says it's not so much about the battles. I mean, we're taking the land. I'm going to tell you about that. But it's... That's not the main point, again, is not necessarily yeah. the battles. It's it, yeah. the people of God and right. the promise. It does seem to kind of hit the fast-forward button at this yeah. point, because after AI and the story that goes with that, things really pick up. We get the Gibeonites. That's an interesting side story, the day that the sun stood still, and then whoosh, yeah. we fly ahead, and southern, northern, done. Well, yeah. except not. Except not. <laughs> because they never fully take the land. Right. But that's a whole other story. I mean, it's it's a, a common story writing technique that we still use. I mean, think about a movie that you <laughs> see. montage. You know, yeah. but, I, <laughs> but I mean, you've got, you know, introduction, you know, things are great. Uh-oh, mm-hmm. things go bad. There's a little bit of, you yeah. know, mm-hmm. fixing of the small things. Uh-huh. And then, you know, it seems like. Okay, we spent so much time. We spent an hour and a half focusing on the first two battles. Now uh-huh. we've got to get to the resolution. Yes, we have big music because, and a montage yeah, through battles. Right. I, I see it, Kyle. This uh-huh. is good. We right. can make this. Uh-huh. And then the second half of the book is all about now how do we divide the land and the people right. to right. settle in. So book of the book of Joshua is not nearly as dark and bloody is most people I don't know they, 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 pack a, they pack a lot of blood in those few chapters uh-huh. it's, yeah well okay well I was just curious because it just seems that the information gets more uh, uh, not omitted but it's just not nearly as important those yeah. details mm-hmm. as the fact that we are just continuing the campaign yeah. to take yeah. the land. And definitely the the focus of our author shifts starts is beginning to shift yeah. after AI about what's important and what to focus on and we just got to follow that trail. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Golly, who would have thought such deep theological r- currents are flowing through the history of taking Right. Who would have thought that was a rhetorical question? Obviously, it's there. There's a reason. <laughs> but, but this is why I love spending time studying Scripture, because mm-hmm. on first glance, in, in an easy reading, mm-hmm. the book of Joshua just feels like all this kind of like information and dark information. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if you, if you really spend some time asking yourself, what's God trying to show me here yeah. mm-hmm. about who he is and who I am and what I'm supposed to learn. I mean, there's just such good depth and good currents under there of mm-hmm. it's not, it's not just a, we shouldn't take as a face value. That's why the Bible is so interesting. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, know? and, and, you know, okay. specifically to this being old Testament stuff that I, I, we've hashed over and over again, <laughs> But like Doug said in his message on Sunday, uh, that the Old Testament was the only Bible Jesus had. Amen. You know? Uh, So there's a lot of things that get us, like the Old Testament is how we get to the New Testament. So if you don't know how you get there, um, you miss so much. And and you lose... Uh, so much of the scope of mm-hmm. why Jesus had to be Jesus mm. and what he did mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. the Christ. Preacher that's Kyle. that's what we should start that's telling stuff. Doug when he's like when he's on us <clears throat> about the Old Testament. We'll just be like, we're just reading the Bible that Jesus had. That's right. We're, there just, you go. we're just reading the Bible Jesus had. I mean, <laughs> you want us to be in the New Testament? We're trying to do as Jesus did. We're reading his Bible. <laughs> Reading his, reading his stories. God never changes. That's right. Sin is just a big of a problem and a big deal today as it was when yeah. our buddy A. Sean here really messed up. We, we obviously haven't figured that out as humans. Mm. And thank goodness. 
for yeah. Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. I, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a simple lapse of judgment, momentary lapse of reason. <laughs> yeah. I caught it. I but, caught it, Kyle. <laughs> but what I, I mean, I mean, as we're kind of wrapping up, but a, a really painful and difficult question to ask ourselves. I mean, what do we marry ourselves to? Mm. Yeah. That ultimately we are committing adultery against our relationship and covenant to God. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Achan was in, or Ashan, or however we say his Aiken. name. I don't know. I'm I going like with Achan. I like Achan better. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Sounds more Southern. Uh, <laughs> Achan. Uh, <laughs> we're in the South. Um, I mean, he was in covenant. Yeah. He he committed and made covenant with the Lord. I did too. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. when I when I chose Christ and devoted my life to him. So, but I do commit adultery in lots of ways. I marry myself to things I shouldn't. Mm. That now get in, you know, they get in the way. Mhm. I'm not far from the choices that Aiken has made, right. unfortunately. Yeah. Ooh, just, the Old Testament. Don't get good. stoned. No. I'm so the glad you don't. I'm so me. glad that we don't. But, and I don't have to be involved in stoning you or you stoning me. Or but what a powerful me. thing. What Not that we should thing. go back to all those things, but no, I yeah. feel like they were very useful <laughs> in some ways. Right. The point. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. wrapping up for today, we have had a great discussion here. If you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe. If you subscribe to Trinity Rustin on Facebook, uh, not on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, you will be notified when we post the videos. You can also find this on Apple Podcasts and at our website, trinityrustin.org. Thanks for listening.